From Sarasota Memorial and the Deb Kavanaugh Multimedia Studio, this is HealthCast, a healthy dose of information from experts you can trust. Hi, everybody. Welcome to HealthCast. I'm Allison Gottermeyer. Thank you so much for joining us today as we talk about the impacts of metabolic and bariatric surgery on a patient's overall health. Our guest today is Dr. Joseph Chablis, the Medical Director for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery at Sarasota Memorial. Dr. Chablis, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Let's start by talking about surgery itself. What types of bariatric surgery are most often being performed? I mean, predominantly in the U.S. and all over the world, it really is two surgeries that are the predominant. They make up more than 80, 85 percent of total surgeries performed. They're the, and they're minimally invasive surgeries, so we use this term laparoscopic. So they are the laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy and the laparoscopic Renoir gastric bypass. The sleeve is about 60 to 65%. The bypass is about 15 to 18% of surgeries that are performed. And those are, are pretty much the most commonly performed surgeries. There are others, but they make up a very small percentage. So let's start with the sleeve. What is it and what are the benefits over bypass? Mm -hmm. Very good. So the sleeve is uh, mechanically is an operation where we remove about 80% of the stomach. But there's much more to just a small reservoir. We use this term metabolic surgery. Um, even for diabetics, you hear this term diabetes surgery. What we're referring to are these important changes that happen at the time of surgery. These are hormonal changes. They occur well before the patient loses weight. And with the sleeve, the way that that works is this reservoir that's left behind, which is in a banana shape, essentially, um, empties more quickly. That increase, what we call gastric emptying, emptying the stomach, stimulates the small intestine. That small intestinal stimulation triggers a series of important hormonal changes that occur for the patient. Those changes have everything to do with improving disease, improving life expectancy, um, reducing the risk of, of early mortality, and, um, and a host of other, uh, of other things that are, are going on. Also, the sleeve is very, um, uh, very interesting in that of all the operations, it has the, the most important trigger for reducing hunger. And that's also a metabolic or hormonal effect of the operation. Compared to the gastric bypass, the sleeve has an advantage in that there's no intestinal reconstruction. So some of these um, things we worry about in gastric bypass patients, which I'm sure we'll get into, like um, certain types of hernias that can occur after, we call these internal hernias, uh, that are unique to an anatomic rearrangements of intestine we don't have to worry about in patients who have sleeve gastrectomy. It's an extremely useful operation for other very complex patients. For example, patients as a bridge to transplant, kidney and liver transplant. It can be a very helpful in patients who have already had complex abdominal surgeries, have complex hernias, um, and also patients who had prior complex uh, colon resections and things like that for colon cancer and diverticular disease. So the sleeve has a very nice place um, in, in the patient who's previously very complex, but it's also a very attractive operation for people who um, maybe wouldn't have considered bariatric surgery otherwise. So, um, and we've seen, uh, you know, a sort of an increase in interest in bariatric surgery over the last, say, decade and a half since the sleeve kind of came to prominence. And, um, and then I think the sleeve has been responsible for that, um, that interest that patients have. We do want to get into bypass as well. So, who undergoes bypass? What's the patient you're looking for? And, and what is that procedure? Yeah, excellent. So the, um, the bypass is uh, mechanically, is straightforward. That we make a gastric reservoir, a thumb size reservoir, and then we do a small intestinal reconstruction. It's called a Roux and Y reconstruction. Simply, if you picture this um, small thumb size reservoir, we do a reconstruction of the intestine in this kind of configuration. So from here to like this. So the patient eats in this small little gastric pouch, there's a roux limb, and then there's, then there's the bile, digestive fluids, and then there's two roads that sort of lead to one road. Um, the bypass is, I, I believe, uh, advantageous in, in, in really three, three groups. We want to know who those patients are who have acid reflux, significant acid reflux problems, because you really have to be cautious in the sleeve in patients who have severe acid reflux. And the bypass is the definitive acid reflux surgery. Uh, secondly, if the patient has a higher body mass index, we use this term body mass index to, to kind of quantify the levels of obesity. And certainly as the, as the body mass index approach, approaches what we call stage four, 50 BMI, you want to be starting to think that 
that possibly the sleeve is more of a step surgery for the patient or a staging surgery and the bypass might be the better choice. And ultimately, um, although there's a lot of um, you know, discussion and controversy in our scientific field, uh, I still think that if the patient's diabetic, if they're poorly controlled di diabetic, if their interest is surgery because of diabetes and because they don't wanna be on medications, they're, um, they're not being controlled with medications, they're having starting to have some of the other problems that diabetics have, then I think those patients are better suited for bypass. So in summary, if they have reflux, if they have BMI more than 50, and if they're diabetic, I think we should strongly consider the bypass over the sleeve. Who is the ideal candidate for bariatric surgery, either procedure? Yes, it, you know, it's, it, our field continues to evolve. Just in the, in the fall, October, there are new international guidelines for the treatment of obesity. Historically speaking, if you use this body mass index terminology, it was from 1991 when the National Institute of Health came up with their consensus data on bariatric surgery, indications for surgery. It was BMI 40 and higher or 35 and higher with at least one high risk medical problem. That could be diabetes, high blood pressure, sleep apnea, lipid problems, um, fatty liver disease, and others. Now the new criteria are 35 BMI or 30 BMI or higher with at least one of those high risk conditions. So those are the ideal patients, but ultimately really what it comes down to is a patient who um, has significant burden of disease. And the idea is to start to think about surgery as a direct treatment for disease rather than historically the way people probably still think about our field is that people uh, see it as weight loss surgery so they have surgery they lose weight and then these problems improve but we know that there's much more that's going on even at the time of surgery so that's probably the the biggest change i think it's 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 people who don't want to be burdened by disease uh, number one i mean we all want to look better we all want to lose weight but ultimately i think the, the calling card is, is really the, the, meta, the disease, the people who have fatty liver disease, the people who have diabetes and so forth, sleep apnea patients who don't want to live with a CPAP and the device. And, and, and no matter what disease state we talk about, it's about not wanting to be burdened by the disease, not wanting to be on medication, not wanting to be uh, you know, having to do anything other than you know, live and, and exist uh, rather than be burned by devices and things like that. So I think that's, that's, that's a lot of the reason people come to see us in the office. Is surgery right for every person who comes to see you? Well, you know, no, of course not. There are certain what we call contraindications to surgery. So, you know, in general, they're, 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 they're mostly agreed upon as being uh, patients who are not psychologically stable, uh, patients who um, have, you know, unreasonable expectations of surgery, almost feel that somehow there's a guarantee uh, of, of type of success. There are certain medical states for which the patient's not suitable for surgery. Certainly those patients um, you know, aren't gonna be great candidates for surgery. And it also depends on the center. You know, in our center, we do adults. So you know, we wouldn't operate on someone maybe less than 18 or over the age of 80. So that could be a contraindication depending on the facility. Although there are specialty places where adolescents can even have surgery because we have a growing and burdening adolescent problem in this country. Someone who has un un what we call uncompensated cirrhosis as opposed to compensated cirrhosis uncompensated cirrhosis can be a relative contraindication. So there are certain uh, medical diseases for which, you know, we, we, it's not the best, best idea. How does bariatric surgery impact life expectancy for a patient? So the, we know this, that, you know, there is nothing in medicine, no single intervention in medicine that exacts more of an improvement over a myriad of problems than bariatric surgery. It literally eradicates disease and saves lives. If you look at BMI subgroups, you start looking at hazard ratios and the National Institute of Health and, and, and NHANES specifically, which is a branch of the National Institute of Health, looks at this question specifically. And you look at hazard ratios based on body mass index for early mortality. And you, know, you look at that data and it's very frightening. So for example, if you have a BMI over 50, your hazard ratio for early mortality is nine times the average patient. And, then, and it's elevated across all degrees of overweight, obesity and all the degrees of obesity. So it's, it's a risk for dying prematurely. Uh, but probably worse than that, and it's a problem, you know, really not just in America, but all over the world, is that, you know, we are, we are a peoples that are living longer, but not necessarily living better. And we're having reduced, significantly reduced quality of life. And I don't think that people have ever had a worse quality of life into their 
their aging years. And, um, and you know, it's something that we, we want to help because with metabolic and bariatric surgery, we can improve life expectancy, reduce the, the degree of burden of disease, eradicate disease, and help people live longer. The diabetes data is the most interesting. If you look at a, a, a study that is the number one uh, cited study in all medicine, it's a study out of Utah from years ago. They looked at people who had diabetes and people who had surgery for diabetes. And the mortality difference benefit is 92% if you're a diabetic and have surgery compared to non-surgery. If you have cardiovascular disease, there's a 56% benefit of mortality. If you had any history of cancer, it's a 60% mortality benefit. So these operations, they're, again, they're just not about weight loss. They're about eradicating disease and extending and improving the quality of life. That's the most important thing I think we do. What do you think is the biggest misconception patients have about bariatric surgery? I think that I would say patients and, and, and uh, lay people and even physicians, uh, unfortunately, and, and practitioners of every walk of life in medicine have this perception still that bariatric surgery is drastic, it's dangerous. And, you know, it's not just my words, you know, representing my surgical society, the American Society for Metabolic Bariatric Surgery, but it's the words of international groups of physicians who primarily have composed of medical uh, specialists. So, you know, for example, the International Diabetes Federation and the Diabetes Surgery Summit were 75% non-surgeons. And the message was these operations are as safe or safer than a gallbladder surgery and a hysterectomy, which are commonly performed surgeries all over the world. And that's the reality statistically for the risk of surgery. And the bottom line is, is that it's the, it's the disease burden that our patients are facing that is the most daunting and the most uh, troublesome as far as their, the quality of their life, but mostly also economically. You know, the economic burden of obesity and related diseases all over the world is astronomical. So you were talking about how this is so much more than weight loss surgery and can really cure diseases, but you've heard stories before of patients having surgery and before they've even lost any weight, their diabetes is gone. How does that happen? How does that make sense? So it, it alludes to this idea of metabolic surgery and for diabetics, this idea of diabetes surgery. There were three large international meetings so far to try to get the world to understand the place of surgery for diabetes. So again, not surgery, lose weight, and diabetes improves. The first one was Diabetes Surgery Summit 1. The second was the International Diabetes Federation uh, meeting. And the second one was the most recent, was called Diabetes Surgery Summit 2. And the idea is that there is important, what we call hormonal or metabolic effects that happen at the time of surgery. These GI tract surgeries create this metabolic change for patients. It's a series of things that happen most important one probably is what changes in terms of the gut itself and, and the way that the gut handles glucose. But very simply, for some reason, we know that the obese diabetic inappropriately absorbs glucose, sugar, in the top of their gut. We call it the proximal gut. And that's, that's important because the, the glucose, the sugar, has to get to the bottom of the gut. The bottom of the gut has to see sugar so it can turn on these receptors that then allow the pancreas to make insulin. And for some reason, the obese diabetic, that's not happening. So what happens at the time of sleeve gastrectomy, Roux-en-Y gastric bypass, biliopancreatic diversion, duodenal switch, IEDS, these metabolic surgeries is that allows at the time of surgery, the glucose to go where it's supposed to go and to allow the enhancement of these gut hormone signals. But there's many other mechanisms. There's bile acid metabolism. There's change in the intestinal um, bacterial uh, flora, we call it the microbiota, and there's all kinds of other mechanisms that we've, we're learning, which are very, very fascinating about how this process happens. But it is, there are, there are studies that, there's a study from the Cleveland Clinic from years ago where one third of the patients who had gastric bypass left the hospital already in remission of diabetes. So these are, these are large numbers of series of, of, of scientific uh, studies. There are 13 or 14 we call randomized control studies that the highest level order studies in medicine um, they're called level one evidence papers. And they all, there are a, a plethora of them that demonstrate that surgery and compared to what the traditional management of diabetes, which is what we call intensive medical lifestyle intervention, is, is orders of magnitude better for the improvement 
of diabetes. And we say remission of diabetes, but what we're talking about is the patient who's diabetic, not no long, no, excuse me, no longer needing medication and having a hemoglobin A1C percentage, which is a number that we fall in diabetics, being below at least six and a half. And you look at the difference between surgery and medications and, and medical following of patients, there are some studies that show 68 and 70% uh, remission compared to zero with patients treated med medically. So that's the most important message is that we need to get still the world to understand the place for surgery for diabetes because right now it's extremely underutilized. It, we might see diabetics you know, refer to us, but a lot of times they've already had some limb loss. They've had amputations, they're on dialysis. They've already had so many problems with their retina and their eyesight, or they've had stroke or cardiovascular disease. We wanna see those patients before they're on insulin and before they're poorly controlled. We generally tell people that the best chance for remission of diabetes with surgery is three conditions. One, we wanna see the patient hopefully within eight years of their diagnosis. If it's more than eight years, they have a lower chance of having this magic complete effect. If they're poorly controlled, meaning their A1Cs are over seven or 8%, and if they're using insulin. So we wanna to try to get the patients before they're poorly controlled, before they're on insulin, before the diabetes diagnosis is established. And even in some of those patients, we have tremendous responses. We even operate on people who are really like type one patients. If you think about a type one patient like a child who's born with diabetes, they're on insulin, right? The pancreas isn't making insulin, those beta cells. So we have a lot of type two diabetics in this country who become like type ones. Some of them even go on to require insulin pumps just like type one patients. And we have an average hemoglobin A1C reduction in those patients of 2%. And we have patients who have significantly improved, even if they're almost like type one patients. So, and there's a life expectancy benefit to that. And also a benefit of what we call the micro, which is the small blood vessel disease and the macro vessel disease for diabetes. And we can see all those improvements with surgery. So it's, it's really is critical. So aside from diabetes, what are some of the other diseases that have these tremendous responses to bariatric surgery? I mean, I would say the next most important one now that's evolving very quickly over the last um, 15 years is fatty liver disease. We call this non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or NAFLD, NAFLD. And it's a series, uh, it's, a, it's an umbrella term for a series of, of disease states of the liver. One is simple fatty liver, which affects 35% of the general population in the U.S. In our patient population, it's 90% and then something called NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, where they're starting to see white cells inflammation of the liver. And then you start seeing scarring in the liver and fibrosis, and then ultimately cirrhosis, which can be compensated or uncompensated. So we have a burgeoning, big, huge problem in this country now of liver disease. The most common reason now for a liver transplant worldwide is not alcoholism and hepatitis C historically. These are people who don't drink. This is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It's the number one cause now for liver transplant. And when you talk about the effect of surgery for liver disease, you're talking about if you can get the patient on the earlier side, an 85% that the liver will become normal again. And even if people have advanced liver disease, what you're talking about is arresting the, the progression of the disease so that we can avoid transplant. And it's that's just so critical. And even if you have what we call NASH-derived cirrhosis, you have a much higher likelihood of having liver hepatocellular cancer. Within, within five to 10 years, you have about a 50% chance of developing hepatocellular cancer. So it's a huge problem. The mechanism of surgery, those mechanisms are the same mechanisms that we talked about for diabetes that improve fatty liver disease. And what do you know? They're the same mechanisms, these changes in inflammation, these changes in hormones, that affect patients with osteoarthritis and other types of arthritis because those same hormones reduce inflammation. For heart disease patients, heart disease is a disease of inflammation, okay? And so what happens is that same anti-inflammatory effects, those same markers reduce the incidence of putting plaque in the artery. And that's, that's a disease of inflammation. Lipid problems like cholesterol, triglycerides, these are significantly improved uh, conditions as well, and also related to the metabolic, effect, mono, excuse me, the metabolic effect of surgery. And even obstructive sleep apnea, which historically we thought was just about weight, so you lose weight for obstructive sleep apnea and you get better, now we know it is a very, very uh, much driven, the improvement of obstructive sleep apnea with some of these hormonal responses. Ultimately, what happens is that people have reduced uh, problems with blood sugar, they have less inflammation, they have less blood clot production, and they reduce the risk of cancer. These are just some of the benefits of the operation. 
Um, you mentioned arthritis, but other orthopedic issues as well. Yeah, it's, it's it, you know, there's a study ongoing now, which is the use of bariatric surgery and total joint replacement. We've never been able to really fully answer because intuitively one would think the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery had a position statement from many years ago, at least six years ago, where patients who are undergoing hip and knee surgery specifically, their BMI should be below 40. So you would think this is a great bridge. The patients would come to bariatric surgeons, have bariatric surgery, reduce their body mass index, and then go on to total joint surgery. Because we know that many studies show that the higher the level of obesity in total joint, in total joint surgery, that the higher the risk of surgery is infections, uh, what we call loosening, aseptic loosening, uh, revision surgery, blood clots. I mean, a host of problems. If the BMI is over 50 and they have hip or knee surgery, it's, it's seven times the risk of even doing a revision total joint operation. So it plays a tremendous role, we believe, in how to approach complex spine and hip and knee operations. And the American Academy for Hip and Knee, uh, the, excuse me, the Hip and Knee, uh, the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons has uh, clearly been in support of, of the movement from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery as well trying to get people to recognize the risks of operating on high body mass index patients and doing total joint arthroplasty. So we think that that's gonna be an, an important, a greater role for metabolic and bariatric surgery in the future as well. Now we talked before about misconceptions, um, specifically the misconception about how radical the surgery is. I think there's also a misconception in the general public or even among some physicians uh, who perform some of these other, other procedures, for example, orthopedics or anything like that, where they say, you know, the best way to impact these diseases or orthopedic problems or whatever is lose weight. So go work out, eat healthy. How do you combat the stigma that surgery is kind of the easy way out? Mm, yeah. So I think that, um, I mean, it's just about science. You know, it's about education. I think that you have to understand the disease of overweight and the disease of obesity. There's this, um, what we call set point theory. If you think about obesity, right, and how we evolved as humans, you know, the body is always in a state of protecting the human being against starvation. So all of these mechanisms for which people lose weight medically, the body physiologically is driving one hormonally to regain weight. It's not that we're weak-willed or we're not capable of being compliant patients or people. It's the body physiologically is always driving the increase in appetite. It happens, we, there's a very important brain gut connection. We know in the hypothalamus is an important nucleus called the arcuate nucleus. And there are two important mechanisms there that are driving hunger and energy expenditure. And ultimately what happens is you got to think about the set point, like a thermostat, basically. The body is always trying to reset that set point. So if you lose weight medically, you have an increased hunger, appetite, and drive that is real physiology, isn't the patient it's physiology. If you look at the difference between medical weight loss and surgical weight loss, just with ghrelin, the appetite hormone, we kind of alluded to earlier after the sleep, you have this tremendous drop in ghrelin, this tremendous drop in leptin, which is a fat-derived hormone. And when you lose weight medically, you have a spiking of this and a driving of the body to, again, like a thermostat, to reset, to reset. So we have to get people educated to understand that it's not that people are taking the easy way out or they have weak will. It's that for whatever reason, when we achieve, when we, when we attain a, a certain level of weight, when we're overweight, when we're obese, it is very hard to overcome physiology at that point. And sometimes the only thing that can do it is surgery because it can completely un, undo that. You see all this uh, you know, passion now with these medications that are out there, right? So there's all these injectable medications. We all sit down, we watch, you know, if you watch sports or anything, all you see is advertisements for these very powerful injectable medications. The problem with the medications is number one, they're insanely costly. Most people don't have access to them. If you don't have access to them, a single month could cost you $2,100, $2,200. Surgery is much more cost effective. And also patients can't be on those medications forever. They can, they can drive the development of thyroid, important, very important thyroid type cancers and so forth. So there's a lot of interest in medicine and trying to recreate what surgery can do with medication. Uh, it's clearly not there yet, but getting people to understand that the medications and lifestyle and diet, they're not gonna overcome where the majority of the American population is with regard to obesity because it's about, a num it's about numbers. 
You know, in the United States, currently the adult population, 43% of people are, are obese. That's 110 million people in the United States currently that, that are obese. 9.2% have severe obesity, BMI over 40. And that's 20, 23 million people. And, you know, in the United States, we're only doing about, say, about 200, 300,000 surgeries. So only do 1% of the population that needs surgery desperately. So we need to, we need, we really need to break this stigma. You know, a big part of that was, was uh, finally CMS, Medicare, and uh, the American uh, Medical Association finally realizing many, many years ago that obesity is a disease. It's a disease of inflammation. It's a disease of cancer production, blood clots, diabetes, uh, macrovascular disease, coronary uh, disease risk factors. This is not just weight. Weight is unfortunately the way that people see it, but there's, there's so much more to the story. If a person is listening or watching this podcast right now, they might have one of the diseases we've discussed that this can impact. They know they're obese. They think this might be a good option for them. What should they do next? Who should they talk to? Well, I mean, you know, in the ideal world, the patient would go and discuss it with their, you know, general practitioner. The problem is, is that the majority of patients who come to surgery, still over 75% of them US-wide come by themselves. Because again, it's, this is everything we've been talking about. It's this tremendous stigma. And, and unfortunately, there is not the awareness of this metabolic effect of surgery. Um, so the patients, like so many things now in life, right? Because patients are very patient driven and very uh, individual or consumer driven, can go and seek a consultation directly. And so like in our particular case in our program, the patient can go on our website, they can get some great background information they can um, you know, be pretty educated. They can call the office and make a consultative appointment. And they can meet directly with the surgeon one-on-one. -on -one. And they can bring all their questions. We do a very extensive um, you know, health screening on them. This is a, a very comprehensive uh, way, way that we go about this. It's not just people meet us and then they go to surgery the next day. It's not that type of intervention. Most of the insurance companies have uh, very protracted diet visits they have to do either with a physician or with a nutritionist, some three and six months long. For us, our medical workup is quite comprehensive. They have to have sleep studies. They often see cardiologists and lung specialists. We might do complex evaluations of their liver to see what kind of liver disease they have. And, and many, many other uh, subspecialty evaluations where we wanna make sure that there's no question that this is going to be an episode, a positive episode for them, that they'll have their operation, have minimal problems, and we can keep those, you know, uh, really uh, to a very reasonable lever, excuse me, level, uh, you know, over, compared to many, many years ago. There was a study done in Washington State years ago, uh, over 20 years ago, where the mortality rate was unacceptably high for gastric bypass. Now, it was an outlier state, but it, it opened a lot of people's eyes up because they, were, they became scared and they started to feel like it was, it was a bit drastic and dangerous. But now with our uh, approach to the centers of excellence and uh, comprehensive uh, evaluation of the patient, um, you know, we can safely and comfortably tell people about what we referred to earlier, which is that the risk of surgery is significantly lower than even a gallbladder operation. And I think then the acceptance for, for people is there. We have a lot of patients, they're very, very, they're very, very supportive. They're very enthusiastic and they want to move forward. And the family, the spouse is scared. So we tell them, bring the spouse, bring your cousins, bring the people from your church or, or whatever or organization you belong to. Let me, let me have an opportunity to educate them because we really have to educate, unfortunately, in our field, one person at a time. We say one heart, one mind. It is very hard to change public policy. It's very hard to change, you know, large groups of opinion. It's like anything else in, you know, probably in the world now. But, but we do have an opportunity on an individual basis to educate people to make sure they understand the, the place for surgery. Dr. Chablis, thank you so much for joining us today. As always, we encourage everyone in our community to visit smh.com to get the latest from Sarasota Memorial. Have a great day.